everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of the Biblia Sophia channel. I am your host, Samuel David, and today I am joined by my friend, Shay Belay, renowned world traveler, academic, uh, spoken word poet, podcast host, musician. The list goes on and on. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, I, I could only say so much, whereas, you know, this is... This is your cover letter. This is your resume. Right, right. You right. should be the one to speak on these things. Yeah, it's it's a it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you traveled to the other side of the country to be here, and yeah. I That's cherish our friendship. Name. Right, I cherish our friendship. I cherish the work that you do, and uh, in in your personal work and with Biblia Sophia and with Anathema, and I see you as a fellow devotee. Of, uh, of the highest regard and I see a connection between us and it's, it's a great pleasure to have you here my Thank friend you. so so Shay I've got to ask right what's it like to be a meme <laughs> I and by think... meme what I should say is what's it like to be captured in a gif for all perpetuity to see yourself along with a caption that says I'm an exorcist you know in in the end isn't, isn't magic a form of mimetics, right? Isn't, isn't it a sense of, at least a, a significant part of it, using symbolism and mythology and religiosity and constructing it in such a way that you create something greater than the sum of its parts, right? <laughs> so that's one aspect of becoming a, a GIF. That I appreciate. Becoming a living gift. Become the, a living gift. <laughs> another. Your new I, I don't know if I like it. The other. The other. The other side of it is at least. It wasn't necessarily silly. <laughs> but yeah, it was. Um, that gift came from. I I did a I participated in a documentary. Um, a series called 60 Second Docs. And that's with, with Vice, right? No, no, no. That, that one's not with Vice. The Vice article was something else. Okay. That came a year or two later. But the 60 Second Docs does like a 60 second profile, like mm -hmm. a character profile yeah. of something someone is. The idea is like, I am this. And I was, I was pursued by a friend of mine, a filmmaker. This is when I was still in L.A., and she had said, Shay, I've been approached by a company that's doing a web documentary series called 60 Second Docs. And the, you know, they're looking for an exorcist. And do you know, you know, you being involved in the occult and being in the scene, do you know, do you know any exorcists? And I said, well... <clears throat> You know, clearly I'm not going to send you to any any Catholic exorcist or Christian exorcist or what have you. Yeah. I said, you know, I have done exorcisms. I don't call myself an exorcist, but I've done exorcisms. Mm -hmm. And I'd be happy to talk about that. And she said, great, let's do it. That's fascinating. <laughs> and... I, you know, I, I showed up and I, I found someone who was interested in participating and I did a, I performed a kind of my own version of a, it's almost a rite of empowerment. Uh, it's, it's a rite of exorcism, but it's, 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 it has a myriad of influences that go into it a purification of sorts, a centering, a, an empowerment, a actualization of the will or projection of the will, and a, a casting out. So there's... An exorcism doesn't necessarily mean a haunting by a disembodied spirit necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think it could be an exorcism of, a, of, a, of, a, of an idea, of a concept, of a state of mind. And yes, spirits as well. So, and that, that ended up going viral. 
and uh, a couple of gifts remain. Where they they have me. One of the gifts says, "My name is Shea Belay, and I'm an exorcist." I'm an exorcist yeah, <laughs> that's the one that I saw, and I was like, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> but the other one has a picture of my mother in this beautiful white dress when she was maybe in her 30s or 40s mm-hmm. and I think the the script at the bottom says uh, there's a second gift and the script at the bottom says I became aware of the supernatural as a child my mother was a medium and uh, I found this really beautiful photograph of my, a younger mom younger version of my mom in this white dress and these windows in the back are flashing this light mm-hmm. out, and it, it does look pristine and interesting. And uh, I'm glad I was able to provide that to them for the, for the documentary. A little bit after the 60 Second Docs uh, piece, I was approached by Vice. They, I guess the Catholic Church was releasing a... They, the Catholic Church was training something like 200 new priests in oh, the yeah. act of exorcism and mm-hmm. how to perform exorcisms. And as part of that, the this particular author um, on Instagram, I think his name is J.D. Bunch, um, I enjoy his work very much. He's a solid, solid, solid journalist. And... He, he approached me because he wanted to cover a different side of exorcisms. And I told him, which was the honest truth, is that I don't want to be... I don't want to fall into this idea of being a satanic exorcist. A very novel and fun idea. I merely wanted to show... And I was, I was a bit concerned about that when I did 60 Second Docs. Mm-hmm. And I was concerned about it when I did Vice. Is I don't want now this this large exposure because the 60 second dogs ended up having millions and millions of views Mm -hmm. and i knew vice would do the same and i didn't want to fall into that's my number one thing (laughs) is i am the most well known satanic exorcist in the world that's furthering your position yeah as a meme i didn't want right i didn't want that to happen all I merely want to do is give voice to that exorcisms are not owned by them. I wanted to almost give representation. Mm-hmm. And he said, no, that's fine. We could focus on the, you know, we could focus on more your praxis and things like that. And it went in a bit into my childhood and my experience with spirits and the exorcisms I had, per- you know, performed and, and what that meant from my perspective. And, yeah, so it ended up being, I, I think it ended up giving a, a great voice to that side of things. You know, the left-hand path, as I say, the left-hand path is not, for the most part, it's, it's often not terribly useful as a term mm-hmm. of definition. Because you see, you know, at least how it came about was at least west within western esotericism now we're not speaking to any of the vedic kind of tantric origins Mm -hmm. of left hand path we can set that aside for the moment we're talking about left hand path as it materialized in the in western esotericism so I've, I've got to ask because you know this is a question that is begging to be asked in and of itself so here you are, featured in the 60 Second Doc, and then you're also contacted by Vice to give what is a sense, essentially an, an outsider's view right. on, on the act of exorcism in right, right. itself, which, which I find fascinating because you know, we associate exorcism with you know, so many things, and most notably, you ask anyone, at least who was informed by cinema, within the last few decades... Of course. What What are your thoughts on, on exorcism? And most will immediately go to the film, The Exorcist, with 
Reagan and the spilling the spinning head and the image of Pazuzu. Right. And right. you know, the pea <laughs> the pea soup that's being flung around set. Sure. So my question, where I'm going with all of this, is what is the pushback that you have faced with regards to your identity in the left-hand path community along with this identity, if you will, as a quote-unquote exorcist. Right, right. So it seems at least ostensibly that these two are not compatible. Right. Right. And I, I can see that. So the I guess we start by saying that the left-hand path as a term, as a way to define a particular group or uh, an expression of, of practice, esoteric practice, is not, is, is not terribly useful and it's increasingly becoming more of the case. So I'm speaking of left-hand path, if, and I'm addressing left-hand path in Western esoteric as it manifests historically that. I'm not speaking to the Vedic tantric origins that's something else, and we can, we can discuss that elsewhere. But if we're looking at the left-hand path, it really arose as a way to, to distinguish itself, to make itself distinct from the other forms of practice happening at the time that were more or less aligned with, still kind of married to Judeo-Christian systems of belief. Mm -hmm. So... You, you know, if you look at some of the theosophists talking about the Black Lodge, so the, you know, you, you, you had them distinguishing themselves from the black witches, the dark, who are using baneful magic and, and doing this kind of thing. The, what, what would occur is that would begin to be kind of fleshed out more with Kenneth Grant working with the night side of the of the, of the tree, the Kelopot or the cliff off, as as people say, as as some refer, and so I think the left hand path we can look at it from. We can we can look at it maybe in two primary ways. In one way, it's it has a moral attribution. So the left hand path is speaking towards an individuation. Mm -hmm. It's speaking not so much to what they might say the right-hand path is a supplication or a, a necessary uh, merging with the divine. Right. Um, as, as the right-hand path might seen as the right of compassion, the right hand is compassion, left hand severity, the right hand giveth, the left hand taketh away. So we can see it as this kind of individualism or this individuation from the divine. And that's one way to view it. And if you look at the morality, you see it as something that is more normative ethics rather than deontological ethics. That is to say that it is ethics that is, you know, one forges or creates their own ethics. It extends out from their own, um, from, the, from the whole of their being, rather than pr a prescribed ethics. Mm -hmm. The right-hand path would then be seen as a prescribed ethics, while the left-hand path is one that is forged right. and springs forth from an individuated being. So that's one way to view it if you're to see it from, a, from an ethical standpoint, perhaps. The other side of it is that it speaks to an umbrella of religious systems. And I think this part is more useful today as a term. Because when you think of left-hand path, you're thinking of Satanism, Luciferianism. Mesopotamian. <laughs> in, some, in some cases, but it, it gets murky. <laughs> and like I said, you have traditional witchcraft. Yeah. And really when it comes down to it, and this kind of goes back into the moral side of it, I mean, we think of, we think of things like baneful magic or, or curses and things like that. But what's interesting is if you look at indigenous magic, if you look at Kimbanda and Palo Mayombe, and you look at Voodoo, and you look at the PGM, and you look at the history of magic going as far back as it can go, mm -hmm. you have spells that could be particularly violent, 
particularly uh, baneful. Yeah. And by yeah. today's terms, I mean, magic that is ruthless and brutal. That worked perfectly in line and conformed to the ethics of the time, the religious tapestry. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't call that left-hand path. So this is a modern dichotomy that has materialized itself. And really, it's a reaction to Western uh, morality. Oh, it's, it's a react. The left hand path exists as a reaction to a refutation of Christian morality, Judeo-Christian morality. So to be an exorcist, if we're to look at the occult aspect of it, or to even we look at the ancient aspect of it, again, this isn't a, this isn't fed by a dichotomy or a dualism of good or evil. Um, as you know, being in, you know, your expertise in, in Mesopotamian mysteries and mysticism, the spirits were tricksters. Spirits had character of a particular type in a state of expression. They were playful or they were, you know, they, they were elementals or they were nature spirits or they were, you know, there's the fairies and the imps and the goblins. All very mercurial beings. Right. Temperamental type right. beings. And you appease them and you hope they didn't mess things up for you. And so, you know, what does an exorcism mean then? An exorcism could be an appeasement. Mm -hmm. An exorcism could be a parlay. An exorcism could be a mediation. Yeah. And offerings, possibly even supplication. Please stop bothering me. Right. Please stop effing things up for me. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, that's an exorcism, right? So I adopt, when I adopt the term exorcism, I adopt it from the history of the term itself rather than that kind of imprint placed by Judeo-Christian practice, religious practice. So if you put that together, so a satanic exorcist is merely, um, and there's, it's, and I have to admit, there's about 10% provocation in there. Mm -hmm. uh, the only reason I would put those two together is in order to is in order to engender a realization that this the the process the a representation of alternative perspectives on a practice and, and a relationship with spirits and how a I like to play with paradox, and that is not to say that I am I am very much a Satanist, but that term itself is not one I, I utilize uh, or I execute publicly without discretion. Mm -hmm. Satanism says too little, the term Satanist says too little, and at the same time it says too much. Yeah. It, it says too little in that it doesn't speak to what kind of Satanist, because to say Satanist doesn't say much. There are some, there's this dichotomy of atheistic and theistic, which I don't particularly like to subscribe to, but that's that's a big one, the modern versus the traditional. So Satanists who are mostly symbolic or atheistic, there are some who are theistic or esoteric, in that they see Satan as a having some form of objectivity or mm -hmm. physicality, and there's some who see him or her more as symbolic. Um, so it says too little in that you're not identifying it, and it says too much in that someone can run with those spots of misinformation. And so I don't like to execute it publicly without careful discretion, but... You know, it is a it is a path that has meant much to me, and I have built upon it, and I have developed it into a comprehensive praxis where Satan is both a symbol and a objective being that represents a catalyst of manifestation, and the adversary, in the sense, the illumination, the black flame, as is a term that is adopted in the left hand path a black flame, an initiatory black flame, mm -hmm. in that it is everything from prokaryotic life into eukaryotic life that 
kick uh, and that kick from inorganic into organic life 4.6 billion years ago on Earth and from single cell to multi cell that rebellion that rebellion of non-life into life, that rebellion of the first spark, that rebellion of the anarchist, and that rebellion that lies at the heart of, of someone like Friedrich Nietzsche and his work, that adversary. I think there's a power in that, and it's a current that runs through nature. It's a natural current, and it's, and it's, it's, it's very alien and it's very human at the same time. And I give the name to that as Satan and my culturation and my exposure to Judeo-Christian world and upbringing is undeniable. Um, LaVey said that we cannot scrape the psyche clean. And I actually mentioned this in my book because I think it's important to talk about the in-between and it's important because Nietzsche also mentioned that you cannot simply do away with God and uh, necessarily try to replace him yeah he talked about that that was the danger of the nihilism of the coming age you cannot merely replace him with something else which he called a um narcotization or narcotics or replacing him with something like an ideal like socialism or anarchy as an identity and LeVay said the same thing. You cannot scrape the psyche clean. Tabula rasa. You cannot have a clean slate. You, you have to seek a way to invert it or transgress it. Or as Nietzsche said, transvaluate or revaluate. Take that value and revaluate it and imagine it in a, in a, in a new way. So... That symbol of Satan, it, you know, LeVay said, you know, instead of being a sinner, be the best sinner on the block. Mm, yeah, yeah. So yeah. revel in. Take this symbolism and utilize, very chaos magic kind of taking a symbol and utilizing it, taking a tradition and utilizing it in a new way to, to positive aff affect. Mm -hmm. And so that all ties into this playful paradox of satanic exorcist. I mean it in a very genuine spiritual way, but also I mean it to invert and reevaluate what it represented before. I want to turn it on its head and, like I said, in a very chaot way, in a very chaos magic, traditional chaos magic way, inject a virus into the system. <laughs> and and, and try to make an attempt, as Saul Williams, the poet, uh, one of my favorite poets said, uh, trick, the, trick the reader to click save instead of cancel. In other words, inject a script and hopefully they will absentmindedly absent click save because they're used to clicking save. Mm -hmm. And then that will change the script for them. So there was a lot at play with that whole with that whole thing. So you mentioned Nietzsche, and of course we have so many misconceptions about who Nietzsche is and what Nietzsche is all about, and what he stood for, what his philosophical leanings were, and how his philosophy has evolved and been bastardized, you know, over, over the decades. You know, he wrote in a way that was, you know, he wrote, um, aphorisms. So a lot of his books were starting with, uh, human all to human. And many of his writings after that used an aphoristic style and that they were everything from a single sentence to a paragraph or two or three mm -hmm. or several pages. And so, it, in a sense, there's a logistic, logistical reason why you see a lot of standalone statements. Because Nietzsche aimed, he, he, he even said, I, I, I aim to write in a sentence what some cannot write in a paragraph, nay, what some cannot write in a book. So he aimed to make these 
well, memes. You know, in, yeah. a, in a sense, his writing was mimetic in the sense that it injected these, these complete ideas that were interrelated logically and, and philosophically, of course, but it's no surprise uh, from a utilitarian standpoint or from utility that you would see it blasted on the internet in these short sentences yeah. out, of, out of context. It's funny because <laughs> out, it's funny because he would argue that they were perhaps within context in, in, in some instances, whole in of itself, a book in itself in a few sentences. Mm -hmm. But really, <laughs> you know, a lot of the a lot of the characters, just like with anything else, a lot of the characters lost without a holistic kind of organic under uh, you know reading of it. Without but it does have value standalone, of course, and you can see its effect on culture. Mm -hmm. But you know, the I saw when I when I wrote Friedrich Nietzsche in the Left Hand Path, um, it was a it was a manifestation of my thesis work, but I. I saw, starting at the very beginning when I was, you know, when I got into all this, now over 20 years ago, I became interested in the occult and, very, and, and witchcraft, and very quickly I became interested in Satanism, and very quickly after that, there was references of Nietzsche everywhere. With Anton LaVey, there's, there's references of, of Nietzsche throughout, explicitly. So he's, he's no stranger to the, the, the satanic current at all. No, or the left and path, or just in the occult in general. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Nietzsche had an impact on a lot of subversive or dissident or anarchistic mm -hmm. groups, groups that were trying to redefine a paradigm. Right. And a lot of different groups from one wing to the other. And the early occult movement was no, uh, was no exception. Crowley canonized Nietzsche in the in the Gnostic Rite, so you know Nietzsche is mentioned as a as a canonized name, mm -hmm. and in the Temple of Set, uh, Michael Aquino he has a Order of Nietzsche. That was a kind of um, the Temple of Set has an interesting way that they kind of organize, and they have pylons and they have orders that are kind of this loosely organized collection of adherents who choose to study and they have the order of Nietzsche and, and LeVay and LeVay discussed Nietzsche quite a bit. You could see his influence on the Satanic Bible. In fact, it was at one, the Satanic Bible at one point was called a Nietzschean travesty Interesting. by academics, a Nietzschean travesty. Interesting. So, you know, and I saw this, it was apparent to me immediately mm -hmm. Nietzsche and the left hand path and Satanism all arose together and it was apparent the influence immediately. And really it's a work of, in a sense, Friday Nietzsche and the left hand path is a work of over 20 years of a casual reading of Nietzsche and then a very serious academic reading for my thesis work and a lifetime of study and devotion within Satanism. Uh, because I think, I think Satanists and the left hand path and just in the umbrella of the left hand path, we're looking for a history. We're looking for a type of historical validation. Right. We're look and and some of us are looking for a way to separate from a Judeo Christian paradigm, to look for something else that gives rise to it. And there, although you can argue that this entire framework, Judeo Christian framework it's impossible to escape it in a sense because we're reacting to it, we're informed by Especially it. Especially here in the West. Absolutely. It's inescapable. Yeah. Uh, but in, in another way, there is a philosophic tradition, there is a, 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 an attraction to ancient uh, mysticism, there's an attraction to a syncretic type of mysticism, and within the philosophic tradition, Nietzsche, without a doubt, had influence. And... That is what I set out to do, is I set out to say exactly how they are influenced, where they touch and where they, where they don't, and the level of impact. And, and I hadn't seen 
an analysis quite like that before. Some of it was mentioned in, say, Lords of the Left Hand Path by Stephen Flowers, uh, by Dr. Flowers, and you can see it in some of the academic studies. You would see, uh, you know, Nietzsche kind of referenced here and there, but no one had really spoken to it. But you cannot go weak if you're connected to a kind of variety of left hand path groups or what have you and not see a Nietzsche meme yeah. posted on Facebook or Instagram. Yeah, I've, I've got a lot of, you know, people that I, I'm connected to on Facebook and, you know, cursory scroll through Facebook and someone is sharing a quote by Nietzsche. Of course. Along with a of photo course. or or drawing of Nietzsche. So he is very much woven through this this thread, the, or he is a thread woven through the fabric of of our respective subcultures. Right, absolutely. And so I I set out to speak to that and give a uh, a bit of history and, and, and devote my work as a kind of offering, to, to create an offering to kind of speak to that connection. So I'm wondering if maybe you could give our viewers and listeners a sample of what they're in for with yeah. your work. Is yeah. that something you'd be willing to do? Sure, sure, sure. I, if you give me a moment, I could read it from my phone if that's okay. Yeah, cool. let's do it. <laughs> I don't have a printed copy yet. <laughs> Wait, so, you, don't have, you don't have galley copies? Just, just <laughs> right, right, right. I didn't, I didn't write, friends. you know, I didn't write it in hand necessarily. <laughs> So I'll be reading from the first, I think this would be a good place, the first chapter. This is The Fire and the Wine, mm -hmm. a comparative the theophilosophical analysis of Nietzsche's Dionysus and the Romantic Satan. So what I do in this chapter is I, I take the, the Dionysus of Nietzsche mm -hmm. and I compare it to the more 19th century... Uh, or the Miltonic with the 19th century Satan as this romantic figure of emancipation, of liberation, of illumination. And tragedy. The figures of, right, of tragedy, tragic love, tragic loss. Mm -hmm. um, the Lucifer that fought the good fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, didn't quite get there, but, you know, we, uh, it, you fight for what's right. Right. And uh, Cain, Prometheus, that gave everything to give the fire to the fire of invention to man and tool making and so forth. And I, so I, I make a comparison there. And so I'll, I'll read maybe the first page. Or sure. so. This is the, the section is called the goat skin one. The sacred pain of a dying mother, the frenzied consumption of a child's flesh, the penetrating gaze of a holy terror, the entwined dervish of life and death, the bloodied face of a wrathful lover, the lustful revelry of a depraved people, the purifying fire, and the consecrated wine. This is the divine paradox of Dionysus, the god of Friedrich Nietzsche, and the god of this world. This god of mercuriality and beautiful tragedy, this dual-natured god of liberating madness and torturous ecstasy, the twice-born god, the goat-skinned god, the nocturnal one, the mask of Dionysus, whose gaze is penetrating and terrible, rests upon the central dais of Nietzsche's philosophy. The ever-presence of the Dionysian current snakes itself through Nietzsche's earliest musings right down to his very last aphorisms, and thereby forms an inseparable bond to the foundation of his most canonical and cherished ideas. Like an ever-flowing wine, the god of fire and madness, unlike most other gods seated upon the Olympian throne, is characterized by a terrifying epiphanic immediacy. His presence is instant and death-like, tangible and voluminous, euphoric and unbearable. The impossibility of the Dionysian paradox at first insight makes murky the innermost permutations of self-analysis. Upon the initial appearance, the how could this exist that Nietzsche's Dionysus evokes is soon metamorphosed, and upon deeper consideration becomes a transformative, this is all that has ever existed. 
and it is precisely upon the painful disinhibitions gifted by this eater of raw flesh that Nietzsche's most profound thoughts are enthroned. In the formative mythology and quasi-derivative history that comprise the iconographical figure of Satan, Dionysus represents a clear antecessor, an origination born from antinomian beauty and a contentious allure. The Dionysian intersection of wrath and hedonism belie the restrictions imposed by a culturally dominant Christian ethos, one toward which Nietzsche held deep resentment. Nietzsche admired the symbological aspects of the Hellenic milieu and preoccupied his philosophy with a conceptual narrative built upon divine actors primarily deriving from the Homeric mythos and Greek theater. Nietzsche vigorously affirmed the metaphysical, ethical, and aesthetic value found in Dionysus and other Hellenic gods and communicated this admiration with terms such as pagan, Dionysian, and titanic, as of titans. Yeah. Mimetic seals of an ancient aristocratic naturalism. The Dionysian force, as Nietzsche would sometimes classify it, was so powerful for him that during his final years, whilst burdened with crippling mental illness, he would end some of his letters with the nom de plume of Dionysus, auspiciously simil similar to Aleister Crowley's self-identification with the beast or Anton Cisander LeVay's endearingly carnivalesque Black Pope. That is fascinating. Thanks. <laughs> that is incredibly fascinating. Thanks. Yeah, I noticed a connection. I noticed a connection when everyone speaks of the crippling stage that Nietzsche went through. Mm -hmm. There's actually the, um, and it's a piece that um, Kayla Mavrakis, who did the art for the book, um, drew a piece called The Horse of Turin. And it's mythologized that Nietzsche in the town of, in the village of Turin, saw a horse being beaten and he ran up to the horse and said something like, according to the mythology, he said something like, Mother, I have betrayed you. Wow. Or I understand you, he said to the horse, I understand you. And he collapsed crying. And that is seen as the marker of his insanity. Now, you know, the academic consensus, consensus is that that didn't, you know, probably didn't happen. But it, it does speak to, you know, an interesting thing we like to do in the West where we like to put holes in those who spoke powerfully, who spoke adversarially, mm -hmm. who were these gigantic kind of, uh, transgressive figures right. and to speak of him in a to speak of him in a vulnerable state but I think with Nietzsche it's it's beautiful it doesn't quite do what some might if their intention is bad faith mm -hmm. it doesn't quite succeed I think in that I think that vulnerability expressed by Nietzsche in his time of madness underlines the profundity of the message itself and speaking to a frailty of, of humanity and how ironic, how tragic and how beautiful that the mouthpiece of the deconstruction of God, the Zarathustra, his Christ, his, his, his saint figure with the snake and the eagle would collapse in a state of madness. Mm -hmm. So I think it speaks to something very human. And I think it's actually almost Nietzsche who would, would have written it himself if he could. But for the last 10 years, that's about uh, uh, 18, 1890, 1888, 1889, is when he had a break. And for the next 10 years, he was more or less um, invalid and his sister cared for him. Uh, and he wrote a lot of his letters uh, his personal letters, he signed them Dionysus instead of using his own name. Just like um, Aleister Crowley would write Baphomet mm -hmm. or Therion or, or what have you. And, and uh, LeVay would write Black Pope.
hope. In fact, um, in fact, I, I dedicate the book, uh, I say, to, uh, to the Zarathustra that warned of us of a dire future to come, and to the Black Pope that offered us salvation, May they both ride the Turin horse to the dawn of day forevermore. So may they both take us to a path forward and reconcile the madness of humanity. Right? So Friedrich Nietzsche and the Left Hand Path really seeks to look at the warning of, Ni of Nietzsche to the oncoming nihilism that is to plague the modern world. And maybe some answers we can find with it within this strange religiosity that has arisen in the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it is. Does, does the, those figures, do those dissenting figures or these antinomian figures who inherited the legacy of Nietzsche, do they offer something as a call and response to Nietzsche's warnings? Do they offer something to reconcile the the doom the 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 damning age that is to come? So that is what I speak to in that. That's pretty catalyzing, right? And I, I I think that's that's also something that's very. I would visceral. hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's something that's very visceral and is going to speak to your readers whether they are. You know, philosophers, or they study philosophy, or if they are members of the left-hand path community, or the esoteric community as a whole, and have an interest in, in Nietzsche, I think that's something that... Keep going. <laughs> I don't know what that was. What was that? <laughs> We're not going to edit that out. Uh, I think that's something that is, is going to draw readers in and you know help them confront maybe some of I think so you know I don't uh, we, you know we were talking a bit about labels and a bit about identity mm -hmm. and uh, I think there's importance in representation I think there's importance in identity and I think labels aren't I don't necessarily try to avoid it very much like like I like I said uh, I mean like like I say at times I publicly the labels I think I want to execute in discretion because I don't necessarily want someone to run away with yeah. an idea that's not a understanding that I've been in control of right at the same time in private the label means very much to me it makes it it feels right to me in my personal practice when I'm when I'm alone or in a small group, or if you and I are are talking like we, we've done for the last few days in private conversation, um, I am a Satanist. I am a Luciferian. I am a left-hand path magician. I am a heretic. I am a thinker. These are... These are statements of intent. Mm -hmm. And I think that carries power, right? I remember hearing about a story. I don't know if this is true, actually. I don't remember where I saw it. It could have been something on the internet. It could be something I saw years ago. It was a rumor. But it was... <laughs> it was a lie. Either way, <laughs> it, 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 it will prove the point that they, there was a... <laughs> Again, I don't know if literally any of this is true. They said a papyrus was found, an Egyptian papyrus, uh, at the time of e Egypt. Egypt could mean thousands of years. Yeah. But anyway, one was found that had on the, on the scroll the word fly. I will fly. And so some, from what I remember from this story, some theorize that it's a statement that, it's a magical statement that I read this and it's, mm -hmm. it's a, uh, now... Um, I don't know if any of that's true, but, but what's interesting, but right, right. But the label of, and so some ran with it and go, oh, they were literally flying around. Who knows? Good for them if it's true, <laughs> but 
the a label to say I am a Luciferian. I am I am a proud I embrace the black flame. I am a left hand path and right. So the this statement of pride or this statement of intent is something that is powerful. And we talked about mimetics, right? We talked about symbols and gifts and mimetics and, and so forth. And that's an important part of magic, I think. And so labels in, carry power just on their own virtue. Yeah. Now, in public, I don't... It, it's, it's right to be a bit hesitant to allow certain labels to be used. But I think in, in your own practice, I am, I am a student of the Mesopotamian mysteries, right? Or you might say I am a, I don't know if you would say priest or I am a devotee. I, I say celebrant because it's just easier. A celebrant, right. Well, I did a, uh, <laughs> I did a, uh, I was part of a documentary that still hasn't been released yet called, I think it's, they changed the name now, it's called The Secret of All Ages and it's a 12 episode or 13 episode documentary that's gonna be released on Apple TV. And uh, I was. You've been everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I try. I try. And the. Uh, yes, I mean, what would you like to be referred to in the IMDb credits for the episode? And I said, a, ce a, a celebrant. And he's like, are you sure? Because the other person on there said priest. I said, fine, F it, I'm a priest, I guess. <laughs> like, I didn't want, like, I wasn't trying to, the priest, because, you know, how would I speak necessarily of, a, of an emancipation or liberation and yet speak to a hierarchy? Yeah. Like, that's not something that's not in, but then if I say celebrant, is that necessarily, if we're thinking of the audience on Apple TV... That's going to be they most... they going to know what that means. Right. Yeah. They're going to think, what is... Is this a Mardi Gras? Like, a celebrant? Do you, like, go to <laughs> dance parties or, like, festivals? <laughs> so... <laughs> it's a demonic dance rave. <laughs> right. And, and so I was like, dances. all right, fine. Put satanic priest, I guess, on that now. Wow. You know? Um, God, you could have been a satanic historian. <laughs> <laughs> Lecturer on sa on Satanism. Historian is something you have to earn. You know, there's a uh, an, another reference to to Saul Williams. He says um, says someone saying, "Oh, you're you're a poet," and he says, "Well, I accept that. I accept that with humility because poet, priest, these are not things that you claim for yourself. These are titles given to. These you. are titles." Granted to you. Yeah. These are ta titles granted to you. I can't call myself a priest. I can't call myself a poet. I spent a lot of my life devoted to poetry. I didn't become one until someone gave it to me. Yeah. I had to be gifted with that privilege. And it's a privilege, it's a privilege that I do not take for granted. You earn a title like that and you honor it with humility, right? And so I wouldn't say, if someone would like to say I'm a priest, I will entertain that within the scope of the experience. But it's certainly not something. You're not going to run with it. Right. You're not going to make and I'm business cards. And I, I certainly remember. wasn't very, right. And I certainly wasn't uh, particularly excited to take it as a, as a, as a mantle, so to speak. <laughs> but It carries a lot of weight. Hollywood. And a lot of responsibility. You know, I have to. I have to look at. You know, I have to. Look, I have to negotiate how this will be brought out on a larger scale, mm -hmm. and how I'd like it to run its course. Yeah. You know, and I think. Okay, fine. Fine. I can see. I don't want. Yeah. Do. <laughs> don't just fine. Do it. Do what you want. <laughs> call me. Call me it. Call me whatever you want. <laughs> so you've got this book coming out, and mm -hmm. you know you've you've got other projects underway. One project that's fascinated me that you actually wrote about in a, a publication for Pillars was The Violent Divine. And after I read that, it, it really resonated with me. And, and 
as someone who comes from a culture that is shaped by you know, the majority religion being Islam, right, right, and right. one of those sects within Islam being the 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 Shia sect and the incorporation of ritual mutilation, as well as you know my own spiritual praxis involving the Mesopotamian spiritual current throughout its its various cultural iterations, in which you know self flagellation, ritual course. mutilation. Sure. Were included. And this is not something that's just isolated to these cultures. We find this even within the the Christian paradigm. We've had it for centuries since the advent of Christianity. We've sure. got aspects of it that, that still exist today. And where I'm going with my question is, you know, I've, mm-hmm. I've seen your your content on Facebook, you know, with, with your suspension. Sure. And I was, hook, hook suspension. Hook suspension. Yeah, yeah. I should say, and how that is, and after reading your your submission, how that is a way to commune with the divine, to transcend this human experience that we have trapped in our flesh. And I'm wondering if perhaps you could elucidate on that for viewers and listeners sure. in more detail, especially as it relates to your work and your identity as a, as a Satanist, as a priest. Right, right. So, <laughs> and an exorcist. It was a celebrant. <laughs> yeah. The, so the violent divine came about, uh, so very early on, I, I was fascinated with, um, physical transgression. So I know a lot of people are plagued with, um, I'm very mindful that some are plagued you know, self mutilation is a attempt to for self therapy. Mm-hmm. So I'm very sensitive to. Um, I think a lot of people who might be listening, either participated in or maybe felt inclined to. Um, do some form of of. Uh, of of mutilation, physical mutilation, something like that, and I am sensitive to those who might have went upon this out of perhaps but I'm not going to make a judgment on why one might do that. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm not I'm not going to I'm in such a position that I I won't begin to do that. But if it was done out of something that is regrettable or negative or self-destructive, then I extend my my sympathies and my empathy. Um for those who do it ritualistically as a point of empowerment, that is more what I might be speaking to with the, with the concept of the violent divine. So very early on, I started engaging in um, various... I started experimenting with bloodletting and blood magic and, and, and mutilation, self-mutilation. And as I grew older, I started to be interested in the body modification scene. I couldn't tell. And well, there's a lot of people that take it a lot further than me. And hook suspension. And I suspended for the first time, I think I was maybe 28, 29 when I first. So this is 2015, 2016. And I remember seeing that picture. You're seated in a lotus position. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So they actually call it that. They actually call it a lotus position. So I decided finally I wanted to. So what had become a maybe ambiguous for me. I never did it because I wanted to, say, hurt myself or destroy myself right. necessarily. I, I, I did it because it was a tantalizing heightening of experience and mm-hmm. it, it uh, separated me from... It created a state of mind, an isolated state of mind. And as things developed, I realized this could be a tool for a spiritual expression. Mm-hmm. I am plagued with a busy mind. That is to say that not simply distraction, which I am, which you've experienced. I have trouble listening sometimes. <laughs> but I plagued... As, as do I. <laughs> rapid thoughts and intrusive thoughts that just can't seem to quiet. Mm-hmm. And when I first suspended... 
So there was a hook on my back and on my knees, and it was a lotus position. It was, the, as soon as I was lifted, there was this massive sharp pain. So these are half inch, they call it sea demons, these massive hooks they put into mm -hmm. your, your, just under the, the subdermal layer. And there was this sharp pain, and then there was this ultimate absolution. Mm -hmm. So I felt this calm and no thoughts, still, still thoughts, still mind, as Alan Watts might say, a still mind, or you might say in the Buddhistic teachings, I thought nothing. And it was serene and it was complete and it was transcendent, I suppose. And I was up there maybe for 20 or 30 minutes. I could have been up there for hours. I could have slept up there. It was, and then, I don't know why they do this. He, he took me and he threw me and I was circling. And it was fine, you know, but I think they feel like once someone has it, they start throwing them. And so I was swinging wildly under a tree. So it was actually at El Scorpion Park in LA. And there was this, this big tree that they do it this really old tree and they, they hook, they, they rig everything up in, in, in the, at the treetop. So just so our, our viewers and our, our listeners are clear, this is not some fly by night thing. This is something that is pre-planned. Professionals are on staff. Absolutely. So this is, you know, yeah, yeah. It's more or less self-regulation. They do have, in some places there is now oversight. Um, there, there is now oversight over it. I don't want to overspeak because it's not my realm of... To me, I just care about the ritualistic. Yeah. I don't... Yeah. I don't... Once it starts getting technical... And, and the logistics come into play. Like or, compliance yeah. and OSHA standards, I'm no longer... You know, like, get it out of here. I just... <laughs> I just want the experience. Just throw the hooks in me and lift me magically into the air. And yeah. then I'm, I'm into that. Uh, but... It was, it was a beautiful, it, it was, a, it, for me, it was a powerful and profound experience. And I had noticed at various times, so I take that all into account. And I take, there was a moment when I was younger and there was a road trip going up central desert of, California, and you can go for a stretch of an hour with just cracked earth and distant mountains, and it really does look like the surface of Mars. And I remember looking out and having this anachronistic, but a radical anachronistic, as in this could be a time that happened 10 billion years ago, or it could be a time that happened um, 10 billion years in the future, or another planet entirely. Mm -hmm. And there was this sinking, powerful feeling of a divine. I had this um, out of, almost out of body, more or less, kind of thinking of myself on this plane that isn't present. And oddly enough, I noticed looking out over this red earth and projecting myself in a time that may have never existed. I noticed that it was oddly similar years later with the still mind. So how could this type of transcendent physical transgression somehow be married in essence to the feeling of a bleak, a profoundly bleak landscape? What is that energy that lies? What is that force or current that lies at the heart of the broken earth and at the heart of a broken body, right? So there's this. And so I began to think of this concept. I, I, was, I started to think of the, the phrase came to my mind that the face of God is ugly. And it, it actually came from a, um, it actually came from a DMT, my own, actually I had a couple of DMT experiences, but one DMT experience was 
I was confronted with, and I think psychedelics are, can be a tool. Um, a lot of psychedelic, actually, I, I haven't had as many as some would have. I've been very discretionary with it because um, it takes me to, psychedelics can take me to a, a very overwhelming place. As it can for many people outside of a clinical experience. Right. And so I tread very carefully um, because they can often be very uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Yeah. These are not bright and happy experiences no. for me. And uh, so they're not ever fun. And they're not ever um, bright experiences for me. And that, that didn't matter no matter where in my life I took them. Anytime I take them, it's me being thrown into a room and getting my ass kicked for hours um, as, as a, a, a kind of lessons and learning something. Very left-hand path. And uh, in one DMT experience, this I saw this uh, insect-like. I was out in the vacuum of space, and this fetal insect that was extended to the size of my of a human. So this within an egg ant. And it said, I am the highest vision of God that you can conceive. <laughs> Meaning like even the most, what you would consider the most flippant, the most trivial form of life is wow. the most highest God. Wow. That's pretty profound. Remember that you, I am appearing to you in a way that you will understand is what it said first. I'm going to appear to you in a way that will that is meant for you. I am, I am likened to that which is your highest God, and this is something you must always understand. The most trivial is godly. And so I thought the face of God is ugly, and that is to say, God is not something, and when I say God, clearly, the dirty G word, but the, clearly this is removed from a, clearly this is removed from a Judeo-Christian context. This isn't the Abrahamic God. This is God as in this perhaps universal cosmos, how you might want to conceptualize it. But the face of the divine experience is ugly, meaning it is not easy to interact with. It is a difficult, it is a painful and it is a terrifying experience. And the violent divine is seeking to um, identify this. So whether it's the sword of Muhammad, whether it's the whip of Christ, whether it's Hecate's dogs, whether it's Satan's pitchfork, these iconographical symbols of violence in a sense of a terror of the divine. Of course, my left-hand path and satanic identity informs this. Of course, of course. But there's something much more at play than that here. It crosses all faiths. And so I thought of this as if I were to think of it, via theosis is the state in which you connect with this terrible divine power. And so external via theosis was the world itself. So that red earth, the broken red earth, the distant desert. So over the years, I would go far out into the desert and I would fast and I would have a form of asceticism and I would do different forms of ceremonial magic over the span of days off the grid. And I've, I've, I've taken the transgressive boundary further and further with my ritual practice, praxis to seek that violent divine. So the broken red earth. And what is that still mind when you have the hooks mm -hmm. into the subdermal and you're, in, you're as a lotus? An initiation rite that goes back 
perhaps a thousand, perhaps more years. And the external speaks to, to the natural element and the internal viathiosis is one that you create yourself. So that is the one that's done through mutilation or flagellation. And you, you hinted to it. So I lectured at this. Um, the last time I lectured at it, uh, on it was at Old Culture back in um, October. That in, was in Berlin. That was in Berlin. And uh, you actually, you know, through our conversations, you, you told me about... We had so many. Which one? <laughs> there was the... The... I believe it's in the month of March, the Muslims who oh, yeah. hit the blades against their the Shia sect. The Shia Muslims. Within the Shia sect. Ooh. And this is a controversial practice, I understand. Oh, absolutely. And there's the, during Lent in the Philippines, um, there's the flagellation, and this is mm -hmm. done elsewhere, but literally pulling skin and cutting skin into the back. And obviously... We have hook suspension and body modification and bloodletting and blood magic and sex magic. Uh, and so how could one break a body to heal it? Right? So mm -hmm. how could one break one's body to heal one's spirit? So that is not to say that violence is baneful. In fact, it, it likely lends itself more towards a purification of the body, a purification of the spirit. You know, a mortification of the flesh. I mean, it's 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 very, yeah. It, it's it's interesting. It's interesting because you know this is this is a paradigm that I grew up with in my own childhood upbringing in, in the Pentecostal faith. That was definitely something. You know, we we crucify our flesh. We crucify ourselves. Right. So, I mean, there's... Except that's done in theory as opposed to literal physical practice. Right, right. You know, we, we see Christ cast onto the cross, mm -hmm. and we see Lucifer, especially the Lucifer of Liège in eastern Belgium, which I have the privilege to be able to see, and he's tied, he's sitting, he's seated upon a rock, and he's shackled, and there's a broken baton, there's the, there's the mother of sorrows mm -hmm. in Santeria with the swords in her heart. The lady of sorrows, rather. So you see this kind of destruction of the body or under duress, under pain, that there is a connection to the divine. There is a state of melancholy a state of melancholic beauty that projects itself. And the violent divine or the god of violence, vios, so literally god of violence, which is a figurative way to try to give a label to this essence of radical catalytic faith faith in the sense of a transcendental experience. So the violent divine is my effort to, to bring to light. And, and I'm happy that was able to see itself uh, come to light in the seeds of Aries, which was the, it was the issue just before the last one, which yeah. is the wayfarer's hearth. Wayfarer's hearth. And so, um, yeah, I was happy to see it in print there, and I think Anathema was the perfect home for that initial seed. Seed. Uh, that seed of Aries. So do you see that seed of Aries blossoming and, and this being something that you will continue to write about to the same extent that you've written about Nietzsche and the left-hand path? I mean, without going to school again and getting another <laughs> Please don't another make masters. me. Please don't make so me. I, get I don't think masters. anyone wants another master. I mean, I want to get another master's. <laughs> I don't necessarily know if you know if I want to devote it necessarily. Uh, but the try defending that thesis. 
I don't want to get a the I don't want to get a master's every time I write a book. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the path I want to go down. I mean, you know, I'll get three the, books the in the next research, twenty years. The amount of research that some of us end up doing to write one book. Oh yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed, well. indeed, indeed, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, no, I I want that is something I am planning to bring to light as I want to fully flesh this idea and give away from a lifetime of experience mm. and um, hopefully an offering. Hopefully it will be received as an, as an offering of a path to better understand these more uncomfortable transgressive or catalytic, catalytic aspects of spirituality, not just for esotericists or left-hand path or Satanists but any or Luciferians, but any religionist. Yeah. It could be a, uh, a neo-pagan could find a place in it just as much as a traditional Satanist, just as much as a Muslim might find something that reflects their faith in there. So that is, that is what I... That will be an interesting book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> an interesting book that will... Uh certainly raise some eyebrows. So we've covered a lot of, of ground here. We've covered your origin as a meme. <laughs> we, Thank you. We, we, Probably my favorite accomplishment that we've discussed so far. <laughs> Jack, goals. dude, that is a life that goals. is a life that goal. is the oh, that is the only <laughs> item on your bucket list. Right. So you know you've got you've got your your Nietzsche book coming out. You've sure. got this this journey with the violent divide indeed, that's indeed. unfolding that yeah. I'm hoping we'll see come into to fruition yeah, soon. Yeah, 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 sure. For that seed, that seed of Aries that to, indeed, to indeed. take root and, and for that to blossom and grow and eventually, you know, see see more of that materialize. Right, right. But what else is going on? What other projects do you have cooking up or or pursuits? Yeah, that we yeah. Potentially yeah, Look so so just to reiterate, the uh, the Friday Nietzsche and the Left Hand Path, probably by the time of this this airs, it will be available um, through Atramentis Press, and they can get it there. There is a professor out of the UC, UC Santa Barbara in California who recently wrote a piece. There is this... Uh, there is this... Kind of anthol the, it's an academic journal, mm -hmm. and he wrote a p. It, it's an academic journal, new religious movements and folk uh, magic. Yes, and he wrote a he wrote a piece uh, on my whole like the concept of the satanic exorcist in American new religious movements. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I know, and it's. <laughs> the life you live. He came right. No, he came. He came and he. He, he came down to, when I was visiting LA, he came down and we did a few video conferences and probably about four or five over the course of a year or two. And then he put pen to paper on, on, a, on a piece that explores this kind of phenomenon. I was very honored. I was very honored. Well, I definitely want to add that into the, the info section of, of this video. Yeah. Like, not yeah. just your social media it, links. What's, what's, like fun, what's funny, publications what's funny is his pre-order for that anthology I didn't know that academic journals had a pre-order. Yeah, that. they do. <laughs> and, and sometimes you end up not being included on that list because you are not a seasoned academic. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm and just a layperson. Him and I had one at, at the uh, at the same time. So, uh, anyway, that's something that is will be out actually around the same time. You should send him your book. Yeah, I intend to. Yeah, indeed. That's excellent. And uh, you and I. Uh, as a culmination of our friendship of the last few years, your expertise in the Mesopotamian mysteries and my expertise in what it is, um, we will be working together to oh. do a comparative analysis. Cats out of the bag on that one, guys. <laughs> That's going to be a fun project. We're certainly going to ruffle some feathers. I think so. I think I think what... what I mean, I, I can speak for myself in that, and I... You know, I kind of spoke to that towards the very beginning, and that is that I see a fellow devotee, I see the same sincerity. Looking at the sincerity that we have for our own faiths, that, you know, there's been a lot of 
kind of flirtation with the Mesopotamian um, mythology and incorporated into left hand path into Satanism and Pazuzu and Nurgle and Marduk and all these having particular symbols within this context. And I think uh, I don't know anything out there that hasn't spoken to it in a very in a in a very cerebral uh, in depth way. What the actual connections could be, what the comparisons are, so what comparative analysis and what they're not. And a deconstruction of what they're not and why they are different. So I think, I would like to think you and I would be perhaps good candidates to bring light to that. From your mouth to the God's ears. (laughs) Indeed. So there's that that is in the works. And uh, of course, uh, you know, not, not. Uh, I have my I have my own podcast. Uh, listen to Biblio Sophia, but if you have a moment, uh, to if you have a moment, you can listen to Deferred Gnosis. We're gonna leave that part out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and I I have music as well, as you alluded to in the beginning. Um, and I have some more music coming out. I just need a moment. <laughs> I was doing a lot of work on Fred Nietzsche and the Left Hand Path, but. I have, my work is a mix of spoken word poetry or slam poetry. I don't like to say slam so much, but um, it's theatrical uh, vocals and kind of neoclassical or my last album was kind of a triumphant orchestral kind of sound with, with kind of aggro, I called it aggro elegant vocals. Uh, so screaming and poetry and then coining terms left and right right all day (laughs) and (laughs) and this next record is going to be a uh, it's almost done too but it's going to be a uh, more uh, I guess you could call more uh, minimalist neoclassical so the way that we put the record together is we imagine a group of musicians on a, an acoustic guitar on piano and myself, and we're kind of speaking around uh, in a room with people, and, and that's the sound and the production that we're going for. Um, so That's so wild. <laughs> uh, it's all kind of esoteric, kind of... You know poetry in my in my vein, so I'm excited about that as well. So that I think is is the major projects that are on the uh, on the horizon. So Shay, are you actively invested in social media? Where can listeners and viewers find you, or no. are you a recluse? No, and prefer not to engage. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I think social media is important. Technology is a great tool for communication and connection. I am, you can find me on Instagram at Shea Belay, S-H-E-A-B-I-L-E, um, Facebook slash Shea Belay, Twitter Shea Belay, uh, YouTube Shea Belay, and my, you can find my recent book at atramentis.com slash Nietzsche, or just go to atramentis.com, and my podcast is at deferredosis.com, you can find those on Spotify and everything else. And if you want to send me a message, an email, ask me questions or connect, connect on any of those platforms, uh, you can reach me at shayblay at gmail.com. And uh, my meme music is on Bandcamp, YouTube, SoundCloud, and, and all those. But thank you so much. And if you want to find his meme, uh, just search for Exorcist, and he's one of the first search results yeah yeah no if you put it's not exorcist <laughs> you're gonna get a lot of other things you have to put it kind of changes at least that's how facebook messages but if you go into giphy and you and you write death exorcist then it i don't know why but you write so death weird. exorcist so then, it, then it will come up but it's 60 second docs or you can go to giphy's site and you can put 60 second docs shape and then i think it'll come up um and i don't mind you using my Using me as a gif, it's fine. It's eternal. It's the it's the eternal. It's the closest thing right now to eternal life that I know of. Perfect. 
with certainty. <laughs> I'm going to superimpose that over his face right, <laughs> right now. Once again, Shay, I'd like to thank you for joining me on this episode of the Bibliosophia channel. And to all of our viewers and listeners out there, definitely hit up Shay on social media. Send him emails. <laughs> slide into his DMs. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Buy his books. Sure, sure. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Sammy, for having me on. And uh, it's been a sincere pleasure and experience. And it's been a great visit. I I see you off tomorrow, actually. You're going yeah. To Leaving the, the frozen north and heading back to the temperate right. Midwest. The frozen tundra. It's been, it's been lovely having you. I Hopefully we it. won't slide off the road this time. I hope so. <laughs> If you're a new viewer and would like to stay up to date with the latest from Biblio Sophia, be sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications for our channel.